Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. Lonnie, you threw me off. A resident fact checker took a second row seat. And so (laughs) I'm counting on you to keep up, right? (laughs) For those of you who don't know, we have people here who check their Bibles as I preach, and I like that. I encourage that. So bring your Bibles, check my work, don't just believe everything I say. So (laughs) I heard a story about a farmer who was usually busy working in the fields, but one day his neighbor noticed that he was just sitting on his porch doing nothing. Kind of weird. So the neighbor says, is everything okay? Are you all right? Well, the farmer says, it's tolerable. Well, that's concerning. What's going on? Fill me in. He's like, well, a few days ago, it was crazy. A tornado blew through and knocked down a whole bunch of trees that I had to clear anyway to make a new field and, you know, get some firewood for the winter. It was remarkable. The neighbor said, yeah, but get this, a couple days later, lightning hit that field over there, burned it up. I had to clear it anyway. Saved me a lot of work. Well, what are you doing now? Waiting. Waiting for what? An earthquake. An earthquake? Yeah, I figure if an earthquake hits, It'll shake up those taters over there in the field that I have to harvest anyway. (laughs) Last week, we saw that we need to have passion, right? But today, we're going to see that we also need to put in the work. So you got to be passionate about something, but you also have to put in the work. While it's true that the Lord does take care of a lot of things for us, it's also true that we have to put in the work as well, both sides of the coin. Today, we find ourselves continuing in that series, the rest of the story, the Bible unredacted. And if you're new here, you may or may not know this about C3 Church, but we honor the Word of God. So this is a place where you're going to come and you're going to hear more scriptures than opinions. We value God's Word. If you've been in church for a long time, you may have done a series called The Story or something like it. And as we've discovered, the story really doesn't cover the whole Bible. We did this as a church many, many years ago, and I wasn't in the Word as much then, if I'm being honest with you. Once I became a real student of the Word, I noticed that I hadn't actually read the whole Bible doing the story. Kind of surprising. They redact quite a bit of it. And so the mindset that we have here at C3 Church is who are we to say what part of the Word of God we should hit the pause button on? What part of the Word of God is less important than another part of the Word of God? It sounds like I'm railing against those programs, but we talk a lot about this. We ask the whys here at C3 Church. Is it really working? Why do we have to put this into a program when we've got the ultimate program guide right here? And there's no part of this that's less important than another part. So we're honoring all the text. And indeed, (laughs) I keep going back to that storybook and checking. The counts today, what we're going to read today, has been redacted from that. And the more I grow to love the Word of God, being honest with you guys, the more that kind of annoys me. We should honor the whole thing. And that's what we're doing today. So a recap, and you can go online through our app. They're going to tell you a bunch of different ways you can see the previous messages. You can go on our YouTube channel, all kinds of different ways, and you can watch the previous messages. So just to recap, Joash, we saw that there were two of them, Jehoash, Joash. One of them is very ungrateful. He got saved from the wicked queen, Athaliah, who wanted to take all the kids out. But Jehoiada the priest saved him. Remember, he got left in the children's ministry for like six years. <laughs> he was saved. But 
after Jehoiada died, ripe old age, 130, he was ungrateful to him. All right? So he wasn't wholehearted. We saw that that was a theme. And the other one in Israel, not to Elisha either, to his prophecy. Eh, one, two, three strikes on the ground. So we will continue. 2 Kings 14, starting at verse 1. Amaziah, son of Joash, began to rule over Judah in the second year of the reign of King Jehoash, same name, variant spelling, of Israel. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Jehoiadin from Jerusalem. Amaziah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but not like his ancestor David. Instead, he followed the example of his father Joash. Amaziah did not destroy the pagan shrines, and the people still offered sacrifices and burned incense there. There are two passages here on the screen. Why? Well, if you don't know, we've been talking about this. The Bible has different books that sometimes run in parallel. This is one of those places, but they're a little bit different. No contradictions, just the chronicler here noting a few things, right? So take a look at it. Second Kings, uh, Chronicles, sorry. That's a combination, Kings of Chronicles and Kings. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Jehoiadin from Jerusalem. Amaziah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but look at this detail, but not wholeheartedly. And there's the problem from last week. Now, we're going to connect them now. We're going to move a little further into it. So let's continue with the text. 2 Kings 14, starting at verse 5. When Amaziah was well established as king, he executed the officials who had assassinated his father. However, he did not kill the children of the assassins, for he obeyed the command of the Lord as written by Moses in the book of the law. Parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children, nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes, Deuteronomy 24, 16. So here we see the opposite side of that coin. Remember the generational curse? Christ has canceled that. There's no more generational curse. But we see the opposite side of that in the law of Moses. So he's honoring that, at least for now. If we continue, 2 Kings 14, 7. Amaziah also killed 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He also conquered Selah and changed its name to Jokdil, great name, as it is called to this day. So here's the thing, though. 2 Chronicles, it's going to give us a few more details on that. It will go into this challenge that he makes to the king of Israel and not really explain what just happened there. But if we hop on over to 2 Chronicles 25.5, we get more info on that. Then Amaziah organized the army, assigning generals and captains for all Judah and Benjamin. He took a census and found that he had an army of 300,000 select troops, 20 years and older, all trained in the use of spear and shield. He also paid about 7,500 pounds of silver to hire 100,000 experienced fighting men of Israel. So, what have we learned? Judah's not supposed to be allied with Israel. They tend to be more wicked and evil. So this is bad news. So here's what happens. A man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, don't, don't hire troops from Israel. He's not going to help those people. They're from Ephraim, he says. So Amaziah says, What about all that silver that I paid to them? The man of God says, The Lord can give you much more than this. Right? No big deal. Let it go. So Amaziah discharges the hired troops. It makes him really angry. Then we get in 2 Kings, that's where that line comes in. So just to reiterate, Amaziah summoned his courage, and he led his army out to the Valley of Salt, where they killed 10,000 Edomite troops. If we go back to 2 Chronicles, it says he actually defeats another 10,000 and throws them off a cliff. Kind of a violent thing to do. But also, the hired troops from Israel that he sent back home, well, they raided all the way back home and killed 3,000 people of Judah, 3,000 of his people. And here's another problem. When he conquers the Edomites, he takes their idols. We've talked about idols in this false gods with him, and he bows down and worships them. So the Lord... He sends a prophet, and he says, why do you bow down to these idols who couldn't even save your enemies? What are you doing? 
worshiping false gods. But since when have I made you the king's counselor? Be quiet before I have you killed, he says. So the prophet stopped and he gave a warning. I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and you refuse to accept my counsel. Now, here's where 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles kind of come back in line. 2 Chronicles 25, starting at verse 17. After consulting with his advisors, King Amaziah of Judah sent this challenge to Israel's king, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz and grandson of Jehu. Come and meet me in battle. But King Jehoash of Israel replied to King Amaziah of Judah with this story, or like a parable. Out in Lebanon, the Lebanon mountains, a thistle sent a message to a mighty cedar tree. Give your daughter in marriage to my son. But just then a wild animal of Lebanon came by and stepped on the thistle, crushing it. You are saying, I have defeated Edom. And you're very proud of it. But my advice is stay at home. Why stir up trouble that will only bring disaster on you and the people of Judah? But Amaziah refuses to listen because God was determined to destroy him. So he's going to use Israel to teach him a lesson for this idol worship. So they mobilize their armies. But what happens is Amaziah gets defeated by Israel. Not only that, he gets captured, taken back to Jerusalem, which is kind of a little bit weird, and he destroys 600 feet of the wall there. Teach him a lesson. If you keep reading, though, Amaziah ends up living 15 more years than the king of Israel. If we keep reading 2 Kings, I just want to mention this. It's going to be a little off topic, but what happens here, as I mentioned earlier, or last week, the chronicler, 2 Chronicles, is going to move on to talk about Judah pretty much primarily right now, not Israel in the north. So if you go back to 2 Kings, it's kind of like, meanwhile, in Israel, Jeroboam II is made king. So if you remember, Jeroboam was the first king over Israel, and he doubled down on Aaron's sin by making those golden calves. It's really, really bad. So we have Jeroboam II, but it's not literally like Jeroboam Jr. It's many, many, many generations later. So we'll get into that in the future. From Amaziah, we learn a lesson in arrogance. Arrogance is when our ambition is bigger than our ability. Arrogance. You see, we talked about having passion last week, rekindling that passion with our relationships and especially with the Lord. But here we see we have to put that passion into practice. Very important. If we don't practice, if we don't refine our abilities, our passion can get us into trouble. That's exactly what we see here. Have you ever heard the term, jack of all trades, master of none? I'm sure you have. I knew someone once who liked to brag about how many things he knew how to do, how many jobs he had. It just seemed no matter what you did, it was like, oh, yeah, I did that professionally before. I know everything about it. But here's the thing. He should have been like 80 years old. <laughs> Don't say his name, Heather. <laughs> but he was only in his 30s. And he had like a bazillion jobs. He's a professional everything. You too, Carol Lee. Don't say the name. <laughs> it was amazing. Boasting and boasting. You ever watch the show Shark Tank? You ever see that show? I like it. Being a former business person from the business world, I like to predict if they're going to give them the deal or not. Or like, you know, I do like that Monday morning, uh, what is it? Okay, Monday morning quarterback kind of thing. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Whatever. It's what happens when you get old. Anyway. You know, I kind of go through, it's kind of like American Idol or something like that. I can always predict like who's going to win because of being in the music industry. So I like the show. We keep it on in the background in the evenings if it's on. And we watch it. And so here's the thing you got to know. <clears throat> Google 
or Siri, is always listening. Right? So we watch Shark Tank, and then all of a sudden, I'm on my phone, and everything about Shark Tank is coming up in my news feed constantly, especially Kevin O'Leary. He's kind of the mean guy, right? He's like the Simon Cowell of that panel. Well, I see an article, and it says, this is the one thing you really don't want to put on your resume or do as it pertains to your resume. And so I click on it. I'm like, all right, let me see. Congregation's kind of getting annoying. Maybe I'll... <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I just wanted to see what it was. It's a joke, please. It's a joke. <laughs> he talked about getting fired last week, too. <laughs> Let me see what it is. And it was a lot of things. Here's the thing. Kevin O'Leary, if he looks at your resume, if you're applying for a job with Kevin O'Leary, lucky you, if you're applying for that job, if he sees that you've had too many jobs, especially in a short period of time, he is going to throw your resume in the garbage. Too many jobs is not good. You see, it shows that you lack commitment, you're not willing to commit, and you might be a jack of all trades, master of none. If you own a business or you've hired people, you want someone who's had a job for like 10 or 20 years, like a really long time, shows that they have commitment, they can commit to something. If they've been doing it that long, they're probably pretty good at it. That's what I want to see. Quality, not quantity and commitment. We want to be good at something, we have to commit to that thing. Commitment is required. But in our American culture, if I can throw the whole country under the bus for a second, <laughs> we often think that more is better, right? More. More is always better. But commitment isn't about quantity. Commitment's about quality. That's what we want to go for. Some even do this in their relationships. I knew another person once who used to brag about having a lot of friends. He would say something like, I have more best friends than anyone. It's kind of a weird thing, but he'd tout this as a really good thing. Like, I have a ton of friends. I'm friends with everybody, and that's a great thing. That's not what the Word of God says. Proverbs 18.4, there are friends, in quotes for a reason, who destroy each other. A little bit better of a translation here. A man of many friends will come to ruin, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. You see, you can't be friends with everyone. Can't do it. Eventually, you're going to have to pick sides. Eventually, you're going to have to commit. Amaziah had divided loyalties. Amaziah lacked commitment. His loyalties were divided between God and false gods, between Israel and God. God's not on their side at this time. You see, we can't have divided loyalties in the things we do, in our relationships, especially with the Lord. James 1.5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalties is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything. They do. You see, people have divided loyalty oftentimes because they lack commitment. People often hop around from job to job. You see this with people dating, not wanting to commit, and getting married. It's really usually because they don't want to put in the work. It's about practice. It's about putting in the work. Relationships take work. People don't want to settle down. 
So they hop around because they know it's going to take work. You see, not only did Amaziah have divided loyalties, worshiping false gods, but also teaming up with Israel. And in that process, here's another thing that people do. He tries to buy his strength. That's 7,500 pounds of silver. Maybe I'll buy some strength. He hires all those soldiers, but the man of God, prophet, rebukes him for it. Likewise, in the world today, there are many who try to buy their credentials, right, or abilities. Now, I can speak of a couple of different industries that I've been a part of, or I can give you examples. Maybe you'll be able to relate. So, if you know me, you know that I came from the martial arts industry before this. We were business people, my wife and I. That's why we like Shark Tank. <laughs> and here's the thing. When we started out, well, it was BH before Heather. <laughs> it was just me. It was in a warehouse. It was tough, sleeping on the mats. Didn't have any money. It was a new thing. Not everybody knew about MMA back then. Now everybody knows about it. Now, what's Brazilian jiu-jitsu? That sounds weird. So no one knew about it. It was a new thing. Took a lot of work. Got a billing company, the program. Right? So I got to get on a program so I can stop starving to death. This is getting difficult. So I call up the billing company. You're going to do the billing, and they give you, like, all this advice. They give you back then some VHS tapes showing my age, right? So you got to watch the VHS tapes and the series and read the books. I did all this stuff about the program. And they call me for the follow-up, and they say, okay, how's it going? I'm like, not good. Nobody's joining the gym right now. Nobody knows about this. Well, here's the solution. The guy's name was Ed Anderson, too, so it's like a prefigure of Ed Anderson. <laughs> here's the solution. So I got my bizarro world, Ed, now, because Ed would never say this to me. Ed would say, pray, right? But this guy's like, the program, no. Pray, so total opposite, kind of funny. So he tells me, if you want to succeed, you need to start a black belt club. That's what you need, a black belt. Don't you have one? And I'm like, what's a black belt club? Is it that where all the people who've actually like earned their black belts get together and they like eat pizza? Like, what is it? Well, no, 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 no. So you have your regular dues, right? So 100 bucks a month, that's what a person's going to pay. But if they have kids, you pull them aside and you say, ooh, you can join our Black Belt Club. And see, as a member of the Black Belt Club, that puts you on like a two-year track. You know, and if you put in the work, you break some boards, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to be a Black Belt in two years. I'm like, that's not possible. <laughs> I'm not a Black Belt. You see, when I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I was a black belt in something else, and then I got tapped out by a white belt because it's better and they don't have black belt clubs. And so I took off my black belt and started over again. And so I'm basically like an associate kind of teacher here with a purple belt on, <laughs> still trying to get a black belt. Well, that's a problem. Why would anyone join your school if you're not even a black belt? Because we actually like teach people how to fight here. Like, that's kind of the thing. Oh, really? Yeah, can't do that. You can't even get a black belt in this art until you're 18 years old. They don't give it to kids because it's kind of funny. <laughs> black belt club hung up the phone. So, told this story before, but it's kind of funny, worth repeating. We stuck to quality. We stuck to commitment. We didn't change anything. It was hard. Living in a gym is not easy. It smells too. <laughs> It's not cool. Not cool. Lots of ramen noodles, but stuck to it. Commitment, commitment, commitment. Years later, years later. It took me 10 years of training professionally to get a black belt. <laughs> years later, blood, sweat, and tears. Finally, 400 students. Ed Anderson, not that one, calls me up. What did you do? Top 10 in the country, in that billing company. What did you do? The exact opposite of what you told me. Bing! You know, I still have the phone. I like to bang it around a lot when I was like, anyway, that's it. Commitment. It's hard. Practice. It's hard, but it's worth it. It pays off. But a lot of people think look, if I just pay the dues, right? I can be a black belt, right? Happens in church, another industry I can talk about. If I just pay my dues, I can get in a leadership, right? 
Every pastor's like, <laughs> that happens. If I just pay my dues, I can get what I want here, right? If I just pay my dues, I can affect things. You know, don't talk about that, pastor. Change the hymns, pastor. If I just pay my dues, I can get in leadership, right? Wrong. Wrong. We, as leaders in this church, cannot be bought. A lot of controversies. I'm going to wait after Easter because I don't want to spoil everyone's Easter. But I'm going to talk about it because there's a lot of controversies in the megachurch. All right, so I'm going to address that and how we're very, very different here. But just as a part of that, hear me now. I cannot be bought. I made all that money in the business industry. The Lord called me out of it. I'm okay. I'm good. I'm not impressed. We cannot be bought. So it's important to pay your dues. It's important, hear me? It's not free. Building and centering, not free. We're doing a lot with it, but important that you participate, you pay your dues. But there is no black belt club at C3 Church, period. The world teaches us to be transactional. Ed talked about this. The world teaches us. Everything's a transaction. The Word teaches us to be relational. And that's what we are here. A Bible-believing church. It's not simply about paying your dues. It's about putting in the work and real relationships take work. That's it. Now, our passion should push us to put in the work, right? <laughs> With single-minded, wholehearted devotion, if we're truly passionate. You see, Amaziah wasn't single-minded. He wasn't wholehearted. He worshiped other gods. So first, we must check our passion. Is it really there? Are we really passionate? Let me tell you how you're going to know. If you're really passionate about something, you'll want to put in the work. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to? So these things that we talked about from last week, now connecting. Once we have our passion, once we're wholehearted, we must develop devotion to that thing. Now, Messiah had neither. Now, putting in the work is about practice. And I've heard people say they don't like to practice. I was also a musician, oxymoron, professional musician. For a while, Denny's like the only guy I know who can make money doing that. And it's because he wears a kilt, I think. But anyway, <laughs> it's an inside joke. You'll see if Denny's here. But anyway, people don't like to practice. You know, and it's a really funny question that every industry I've ever been in, I've been asked this question. It's hilarious. How did you get that good? Not that I was the best. I was not the best in any of these industries. But I was good. How did you get that good? I'm like, I practiced 12 hours a day. That's how I got that good. The people better than me, they complain when they go on tour <laughs> because they can't practice enough. They have devotion, passion to these things. You just practice, practice, practice. Same thing, martial arts. How did you get that good? Practice. you got to do it. How do you know so much about the Word? Practice. I read it a lot. I listen to it all the time. Practice. Now, people may not like practice, but everybody has practices. Everybody has habits. You may not like practice, but there's things you practice a lot. And so getting good at stuff is about adjusting those practices. That's it. That's the practical matter here. Put in the work into what really, really matters. Now, there are some Christians who will say, see, we don't like, if you're new here, we don't like, like typical mantras that people mindlessly say. And here's one of them. Christianity, it isn't about religion, it's about relationship. Partially true. 
But the Bible never says that religion isn't a good thing. In fact, it says it's a very good thing. Read James. Right? Taking care of widows and orphans. This is perfect religion. It's about work, too. A lot of the people who say that say it, I'm guessing, because they're lazy. Right? So you get these types of people. Now, while it's true, we are not saved by works. It's not what I'm trying to say. Grace alone, faith in Jesus Christ. But it's also true that our work is evidence of our salvation. Furthermore, I'm going to show you what the Word says about that. The Word says we are created for good works. So here's one that I'm going to show you. And most of you know this, Ephesians 2.8. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. That's where everybody stops. They don't like the next part. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ. Why? So we can do the good things. That's good works in Greek right there. He planned for us long ago. Why? So that we can do good works. Let that sink in. We have to put in the work. <laughs> there are too many that subscribe to this greasy gray, slippery salvation thing. I'm dunked and I'm done. You ever hear that? Like, I'm good. I'm going to get baptized and just go do whatever I want. Amazing. Amazing. I've seen it. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm dunked. That's it. I'm set. Regardless of how much I sin, what I do, <laughs> that is not what God's Word says. Let's take a look at some more text, just in case. I told you, you don't have to believe me. Believe that. So, Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, one of his nicest letters, yet he still says this. Philippians 2.12, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. I need to stop there for a second and explain this to you. <laughs> so I do read this in the Greek when I prepare. I think about it, and when I have questions, I call my Greek teacher who's watching right now, so I'm not going to try to pronounce this, but I can read it. So I checked because I'm like, no, nah, deep reverence isn't in there in the Greek. It doesn't say reverence there. There's a different word in Greek for that. Why did they do that? I'll tell you why. It's an Americanized translation. Right? Because what do we have? Another mantra. I bet you heard this. When it says fear in the Bible, it's not really fear. It's, it's just talking about like a kind of reverence that we had for God. It doesn't really, it can't mean fear. Yeah, because God's Santa Claus. No, it means fear. And I want to show you here, this is going to be hard for you to read, with fear and terror. That's what that word means. And that's why most, the closest you're going to get in an American Bible translation, the closest, fear and trembling. That's the closest you're going to get. So I contacted my Greek teacher because I'm like, that just doesn't seem right to me. And so I sent her a text and I said, hey, did I get this right, that tromos word? Do, do, does that mean terror, but also implies the action of shaking? Because it's like tremor, like, like tremor. Yes, exactly right. Thank you. Fear and terror that causes you to shake. Could Paul be any more specific no, fear and terror, just let that sink in. That is the Word of God. And I inserted the better translation, the original. Because the original says something drastically different. Fear and terror. Work out your, you better make sure you're saved or you're going to hell. That's a scary place. You should be terrified of hell. 
The Word of God says that too. It's not just coming from me. I'm just reading you the original translation of the Word of God, fear and terror that causes you to shake. That's the better translation. Let that sink in. It's the exact... That, that's how we, you know, we're going to be good. You'll live. We have food upstairs. So <laughs> I don't know why I do it. It's not on you. Most of the people here, you're actually really cool. Like, you're like, no, I'll preach more. So that, that's good. Healthy church. It's just an old habit. I apologize. I do it all the time. And then I overexplain myself. Anyway, food upstairs afterwards. Don't worry. You'll live if you're hungry. <laughs> you can go get something to eat now, whatever. I don't care. But <laughs> it's, it's up there, too. You can hear it. You can hear it even in the bathroom, which is really creepy. So if you go to the bathroom, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Tangents, where am I? Anyway, it's why we're there. It's why we're there. Tony will tell you, it came from a mega church, big church. It's not working. People tell me, oh, you know, wow, there's so many people in the seats. Yeah? Let's see if they stay. It's a revolving door. 67% of Christians from the previous generation, if you're like a little older than me, and now you have grown-up kids, 67% dropout rate. That's not a good thing. I'm not smirking because it's funny. It's not. It's sad. Yet, I still have insanity. People from that generation who have kids like a little younger than me, whatever, they don't go to church, whatever. But hey, pastor, how come we're not doing this? My old church, we used to do this. I want to put this on the website. We aren't your church back home. <laughs> how come we don't do this? Where's your kid? That's why. Right? Now, megachurch scandals. Why did that happen? <laughs> because you gave everybody a watered-down version of this. You gave everyone quantity, no quality. You told them they didn't have to put in any work. And when they started going through hard times or when this didn't work for them, they fell away. You're a liar. You got churches out there. You're always going to be healed. You just don't have enough faith. It's fine. Then when they get sick, I watch people who come from that, and they die of cancer. They die from cancer. But why? Why did this happen? Because you were lied to. That's why. You were lied to. So I'm not going to do that to you guys. We got to fix that 67% drop. That's crazy, but it's not working. Because people are told that they don't have to put in the work. And if you're new to this, it's work, but it's worth it. It's worth it. So what does working hard to show the results of our salvation look like? 2 Peter 1.5. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith. Wow. We're supposed to supplement our faith? Yeah, you are. With a generous provision of moral excellence. And moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with patient endurance. And patient endurance with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love for someone? <laughs> Everyone. Supplement your faith with moral excellence. What would it look like to be morally excellent to someone's face and behind their back? Morally excellent. When nobody is watching you except Google and Siri and Facebook through your computer camera. Don't worry. If you're not doing anything wrong, you're good. <laughs> so I don't worry about it. Moral excellent. Knowledge. Here's another one. You get this like thing that like Christians can be stupid. No. Knowledge. Supplement your faith with knowledge. What would it look like to be in the word all the time? James. Remember it? James 1, 5. If you want wisdom, ask for it. The Holy Spirit. If we are temples of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? We have God in us. Was well, God stupid? No. We have knowledge from God. Knowledge. 
It's right here, too. We have total, just abundant access to it. Don't get me started. Knowledge. He also gives self-control. That's interesting. These are starting to sound like the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, right? Remind you of that? We've been talking about that. Oh, it's kind of redundant in here. Self-control. So you're going to use that knowledge to think about what comes out of your mouth and what goes in it. Patient endurance. Patiently waiting for the Lord while putting in the work. Do we have that balance? Are we patient with others around us? Do we endure suffering? Romans 5. Do we endure suffering patiently without complaining? I don't know. Godliness. Are we trying to be like Jesus? Brotherly affection. Proverbs. Are we doing that? Are we loving everyone? These are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. I want you to meditate on this. You see, Jesus requires commitment, and these are the steps to putting that in place. This is putting in the work. We are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. So that we can do the work. Here's a key. 2 Peter 1.8. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everybody who took the time to come in here today. I thank you for everybody watching online, a lot of people. Thank you for them from far away. But if you're from close, I want to encourage those people to come on in here and be a part of the body of Christ, filled in the unity with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray, I pray that you just work in these people to make them vehicles of your love as they go out this week productive in their knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We thank you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.